A nameless orc wandered the foothills of Vardenfell. He had no kin, he had no companions, not even Malakath deigned to speak with him. He was utterly alone. Had he been ambushed by bandits in this moment, not a soul would have mourned for him. But the tides of fate are ever enigmatic, and unbeknownst to the Nameless One, his wayfaring was not without purpose. A malign force was beckoning him, seducing his subconscious mind. The force lured him into an inconspicuous cave, and in the dark recesses of the grotto he found it, a sword. Its blade was black as the void, etched along its length were blazing red runes, and from those deep crimson grooves, malevolent sorceries smouldered. The Nameless One examined the sword, and the runes glowed in time with his breaths, like bellows stoking furnace flames. Of course the blade wasn't talking, but there was something hypnotic about the way those runes responded to his respirations. The orc gripped the hilt of the black blade, and swirls of violet smoke coiled around his fist like vaporous vipers. Little did the vagabond know, this sword would become him, and together they would make the world bleed. Cries of terror would welcome them wherever they roamed, settlements would burn, blood would soak the rushes and flood the streets, and the metallic scent of death would fill the atmosphere. The Umbra Sword had found a host, and woe betide any soul unfortunate enough to cross paths with them. This is the story of the Daedric artifact that came to life, and it began in ancient times, when the Prince of Precarious Pacts, Clavicus Vile, walked Tamriel in search of an enchanter. He wished to create a relic as foul and treacherous as its master. The Lord of Souls novel details the creation of the Umbra Sword. It says, the Daedra Prince Clavicus Vile wished a weapon made. It was to be an instrument of mischief in Nern, a source of amusement for him, a weapon that would send him souls. At first, however, he couldn't find a smith who could do the work. He spent months, some sources say years, in frustration, until the witch Nenra Ware came forth. Soul trap enchantments are not difficult to imbue within weapons, but Clavicus Vile was not satisfied with simply having a sword that could fill a soul gem. He wanted a sword that would send the souls of the slain directly to his realm, the Fields of Regret. This required a more complex enchantment, and the ancient witch was suspiciously eager to help the prince. She made the weapon, but it was unstable, and she told the prince that he would have to imbue it with some of his own power to make it whole, and communicate with it on the mortal plane. Vile gave her the power she asked for. It's ironic, really, the lord of insidious bargains and double-edged deals, surrendering his power to a strange sorceress, seemingly without question, Nenra Ware fooled Clavicus Vile, purloining a significant chunk of the prince's power. It was a trick that the trickster god Lorcan himself would have been proud of. Just as the Aedra had sacrificed their power for the creation of the mortal realm, Vile had fallen into the same trap. Since that day, rumours have spread that this was no mortal witch, but rather the mad god Sheagorath in disguise. And to so thoroughly best a god as shrewd as Vile, I'm inclined to agree. Beneath her threadbare cowl, the witch grinned, her long crooked nose and prominent chin jutting from the shadow of the hood like mountain summits. Clavicus Vile's ethereal essence seeped from his youthful skin and soaked into the infernal blade. Barbus padded anxiously about his master's legs, imploring Vile to strike down the witch before the hex could be completed. But Clavicus Vile was besotted by the thought of all the chaos this blade would bring to the Mundus. When the enchantment was finished, Vile was encumbered by an overwhelming lethargy. His hand shook as he reached for the blade, but before he could grasp it, his knees buckled. The witch pulled back her cowl, and the mad god, seized within the throes of a manic episode, howled with laughter. An indigo-hued haze began to emanate from the Umbra Sword, and it filled Vile's frail mind, obscuring his cognition and his vision. When the mist finally began to recede, the Mad Witch was gone, along with the blade. The Prince of Pacts, too weak to seek vengeance himself, set Barbus on the Witch's trail. She was found in the heart of the forest, but Umbra was nowhere to be seen. Clavicus Vile sat upon his throne as the Witch was forced to her knees before him. He watched intently as the head was struck from the Enchantress's shoulders. But Vile was not satisfied, for there was nothing of Sheagorath left in her. 
so he sent his Scarfin servants across the mortal realm in search of his hidden relic, but the enfeebled prince never found it, and some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. History became legend, legend became myth, and for many years the Umbra Sword passed out of all knowledge, until, when chance came, it ensnared a new bearer. The nameless orc had entered the cave alone, a vagrant, insignificant in the eyes of gods and mortals. But he emerged with a companion. He guarded the black blade jealously, for he had never possessed anything of such value before. By day he roamed with the sword on his back, emboldened by the sudden sense that, even if highwaymen were to ambush him, he would finally be able to defend himself. It was a strange feeling, self-worth. By night he conversed with it, and he watched the subtle incandescence radiate through the sword's etched runes, as if some transcendent power lay dormant within its core. Once he had learned the cryptic way the sword communicated, the nameless orc began to understand its will. The blade was not at all, nor a servant. It was his equal. This was symbiosis. At first, the messages he deciphered from the runes and their fluctuations were simple. Us. United. Ultimate. Umbra. Us. United. Ultimate. Umbra. The orc held these words in his mind at all times. He muttered them with every step of his unbounded journey, and he encanted them to himself as the veil of sleep descended on him each night. Soon he found that only the final word was necessary, for the first two were united, and the ultimate word was Umbra. So he whispered only the one word to himself from then on and the word caressed him like a woolen cloak against the elements. Umbra, the darkest part of shadow. And with the name came a darkness that overwrote all the feelings of self-loathing that once occupied his psyche. Umbra's despair at being ostracized was replaced with anger. So he descended from the hills and unleashed his newfound power on a nearby settlement. He slaughtered without discrimination. Anything that lived fed the black edge of Umbra. And when every soul had departed for the fields of regret, he put the village to the torch. He sat before the inferno cross-legged. His new black metal appendage, which was now a part of him, lay across his lap. The flicker of flames swirled across the plate of his armour like amber dancers. But no reflections could be seen upon the blade. It seemed to soak in all colour. This was but the first of Umbra's bloody deeds, and he soon became a blight upon the Ashlands. In the 427th year of the Third Era, the Nerevarine sought out Umbra, and we can hear of the Orc's deeds in his own words. What is the use of knowing my name? If it will make you more comfortable, you may call me Umbra. It is the name of my blade, though it may as well be mine. I have travelled from one end of the land to the other. I have killed creatures that can stop a man's heart with but a look. I have the blood of man and myrrh uncountable on my hands. I have seen the atrocities of war and the hideous excesses of peace. There is nothing left for me in this world. I have seen the wholesale slaughter of men, women, entire races of people. Villages have burned before my eyes. My hand has held the torch, and my hand has thrown water on the flames. I have been ankle deep in blood, swinging umbra in a wide arc, all for the glory of the battle. And here I still stand. I have no more to do in this life. All that is left for me is my own death, and the gods have cheated me of that. All I ask is to die like a warrior. It is my curse, though, that I found no one that can best me in combat. Are you the one that can? Can you come and lift me from these shackles of life? The Nerevarine did provide Umbra with a warrior's death, but it did little to alleviate the agony that filled this orc's tragic existence. The Umbra Sword chose its target meticulously. It sought out a host who was physically formidable, but mentally vulnerable. And once it had instilled its name within the orc's mind, the host was little more than a slave. It convinced the orc that they were equals, engaged in a symbiotic relationship. But in reality, the blade was a parasite, and the orc was a tool of destruction, nothing more. What's most peculiar is the fact that the orc named Umbra could not aptly distinguish between his good deeds and his evil deeds. Whether he was saving innocents or butchering them, the only thing that mattered to the sword was the steady influx of souls. It was ravenous, and it was not a picky eater. After claiming the Umbra sword, the Nerevarine was strong-willed enough to resist the humming runes, and in his wisdom, donated the blade to Mournhold's Museum of Artifacts. But the blade could not be imprisoned forever, 
and it did not abide being gawked at by wide-eyed observers. Somehow it left Morrowind, and was found six years later, leagues away in the heartland of Cyrodiil. This time the blade prioritised naivety above all. It did not seem content merely adopting a warrior as its mindless tool. This time it sought to corrupt the purest soul it could find. Pell's Gate, a humble farmstead just south of the Imperial City. A young Bosmeri girl named Lenwyn lived in Pell's Gate, tilling the land and learning the art of swordplay from Iroke the Wide. It isn't known how Lenwyn came upon the Umbra Sword. Perhaps she was sitting on the banks of the White Rose River, watching the slow meandering of the current, when the blade materialised beneath the clear waters. Perhaps she attained it from a roving merchant. Whatever the case, when Lenwyn brought the blade back to the township, the other settlers noticed a change in her demeanour. According to Eroke, She just showed up with it one day, said it was called Umbra. But she was different. She'd always been fair with a sword, but she began looking for fights, became bloodthirsty, and then started calling herself Umbra after the sword. Lenwin, now named Umbra, was driven out of Pell's Gate and joined a band of mercenaries, but that too was short-lived, and soon, like the orc who preceded her, she became a recluse. Perhaps it was because she still held on to some remnant of her past name and life, but Lenwin confined herself within the ancient alien ruin of Vindazel. She even issued the Champion of Cyrodiil with a warning when they stumbled upon the self-exiled warrior. According to the memoirs of the legendary demigod hero Morahaus, Vindazel had been one of the most egregious examples of the Aeliad Empire's sadistic art tortures. Echoes of the Wailing Wheels are said to resonate through the cold stone corridors of the empty city, and poor Lenwin felt she belonged there. Despite all the barbarity, a shared trait among Umbra's hosts is regret. If Clavicus Vile claimed their souls upon death, then the sword's wielders would have had an eternity to ponder this remorse, in the appropriately named Fields of Regret. Upon Lenwin's death, the sword returned to Clavicus Vile, and you would think that this was a great relief to the Daedra Lord. Quite the contrary, the reclamation of Umbra proved calamitous to the Prince of Pacts. The Umbra Sword had grown bold, and did not fear its master. The sword cut Clavicus Vile, and absorbed yet more of the Prince's power. With the energy of all those captured souls, and an infusion of deific essence, Umbra was strong enough to take on a form outside of the blade. It manifested as a dark being, vaguely in the shape of a man with eyes like holes into nothing. Concerned that the nebulous entity would escape and evade him in the mortal realm, Vile constructed new walls within his realm. He was weakened, but he was still the lord and architect of his personal plane of oblivion. The spirit of Umbra remained hidden for some time, but soon the desire to consume more souls became overwhelming. And this is where the story gets rather complicated, as a great deal of what follows takes place in the Elder Scrolls novels by Greg Keyes. Maybe someday we'll retire to my tower to analyse the text in detail, but for now I'll keep things simple, at least as simple as the rather obscure events of the books allow. A device called an Ingenium was created in order to keep the meteor Bar Dao afloat above Vivek City. The warrior poet had been using his divine powers to keep the Ministry of Truth from crashing into the city, but with the return of the Nerevarine and Vivek's disappearance, there was nothing stopping the inevitable collision. The price for such a machine was exorbitant, however, and the Ingenium used mortal souls for fuel. Umbra took the creator of the Ingenium, named Vuhon, captive, and ransomed his life for a hefty price. Umbra let him live, but only if he helped the spirit escape the fields of regret. Together they tore a huge chunk of Vile's realm free in the form of Umbriel, the floating city. They built a new Ingenium, and used their combined essences to power the device. As with all his other victims, Umbra corrupted Vuhon, as well as the entire floating city, leading Vuhon to begin calling himself Umbriel. At this point, Umbra and the Umbra Sword were two distinct entities, and Vuhon's former companions sought out the sword, and endeavoured to use it against Umbra. During the interim, the sword had turned another host into a barbarous beast, but he was defeated, and Vuhon's companions, named Sul and Atrobus, acquired the blade. By plunging the Umbra Sword into the Ingenium, the Umbra Spirit was once more contained within the blade, but Clavicus Vile chose this opportune moment to materialise. He reclaimed his relic and thrust it into Saul's chest. 
On the threshold of death, Saul threw himself onto the orb of the Ingenium, with the sword still embedded between his ribs. Saul and the sword were both immediately incinerated. Vile reclaimed his lost power, and the Umbra sword would no longer menace the prince. Or so it seemed. The sword supposedly reappeared on Tamriel around 150 years later. It was discovered by an imperial treasure hunter named Cressetus, after he fell through a chasm in the Velofi Mountains, breaking both of his legs. Cressetus was struck by a potent fever dream, in which he floated in a sea of black. Before him, bobbing on the swells, was a sword unlike anything he had ever seen. And when he woke, it was there on the ancient cobbles before him. Cressetus began calling himself Umbra, and donned a set of ebony armour. But eventually he was slain by the last dragonborn, and the fate of the Umbra sword hangs in the balance. While that may conclude the tale of the living sword, there is a pressing question about the artifact's nature. Is it sentient, or is it but a shadow of its hallowed master? Vile himself asserts that there is no Umbra. This thing that suffers from the delusion that it's its own person is actually nothing of the kind. Do you understand? No more than a stone rolling down a hill is capable of real self-locomotion, or an abacus of doing math by itself. What was in this sword was me, plain and simple. If someone cut your leg off, and the leg started calling itself Umbra, it would still be your leg, wouldn't it? You wouldn't humour it, would you? Help it out with its delusions of grandeur. There's no denying that Clavicus Vile is a specialist in the art of persuasion. If he had a job on Tamriel, he'd be a used guar salesman. But I think the Prince of Pacts is coping here. Barbus too acts as a repository for a significant portion of Vile's divine power. Vile would claim that Barbus is merely a loyal, subservient pet hound. Yet Barbus often acts as the voice of reason, keeping the impulsive youth from making brash decisions. Of course, Vile is more powerful and has the final word, often to his own detriment, but Barbus remains his own entity. So long as the nature of consciousness is undefined, this discussion will always be subjective and speculative. But you can see why Vile would so adamantly downplay Umbra's individuality. If he concedes that Umbra is its own entity, bearing its own free will, then he will have to admit that he's been outwitted by the blade on several occasions. Such a concession would ravage his swollen pride. An excerpt from the Lord of Souls book states, The sword is a soul stealer, and over time it comes to possess its owner. But whether by design, or by contact with mortal souls, or simply because it is in the nature of Daedric energies, in time the part of Vile that was in the sword became a thing of its own, a sentient being. The Umbra Sword derives from Clavicus Vile, no doubt. It inherited aspects of the Prince's cunning and cruelty, and in some respects, it's hard not to wonder whether Vile admires the sword's success in consistently undermining him. The Umbra Sword is a dangerous artifact. Throughout my years as a Daedrologist, I was always hesitant to lay my hands upon the blade. But my curiosity won me over, eventually, and in researching this video, I made the expedition to Champion's Rest in the Velofi Mountains. I recovered the sword and brought it back to my tower for appraisal. I'm going to be honest with you, I've heard its unspoken whispers. I felt its ethereal grasp on my psyche as I wrote this piece, and I must warn you against seeking out this artifact in your adventures. Even my wards seem incapable of averting its dark influence. Beware, dear friends, for the Umbra Sword is alive, and it will corrupt you. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Socials, including Discord and Twitter, can be found in the description, along with my Patreon. Pledges are immensely appreciated, but please only consider it if you can afford it. Thanks again. My name is Umbra, and I'll see you in the next one.